Ethereum's long-awaited, highly anticipated and much debated move to a proof-of-stake consensus is almost upon us. Put it in the diary, folks, September 15th, the confirmed date for one of the most significant moments in crypto history. And like a nine-year-old me roaming around Kakariko Village in the 1998 masterpiece The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, so-called ETH heads are struggling to keep their pants dry from the excitement. But as you'd expect with something so big for the space, there's a huge amount of questions, speculation, and misinformation flying about. So today, we're gonna to cut through all of that conjecture like a samurai saw through Land of Lakes butter by taking a look at the top five myths concerning the merge and what's really waiting for Ethereum hodlers at the end of the upgrade colored rainbow. Welcome to CryptoSnap. Ethereum's fees, as it were, come in the form of something called gas. Gas is measured in guay, giga way, which is essentially just a very, very, very small amount of ETH, one billionth to be exact, with way being one quintillionth of an ETH. This gas is paid to the Ethereum network's proof of work miners as a reward for carrying out the processor intensive calculations required to validate transactions and indeed literally everything that's happening on the network. Over the NFT artwork craze of 2021, $4 million for a self-replicating drawing of a photocopier, anyone? Ethereum's gas fees started getting absolutely ridiculous. I mean, we're talking $15 worth of fees just to send some ETH, and if you were trying to mint an NFT at that time, the cost could easily spiral over 100 bucks. Indeed, things got so bad by April 30th of this year, that during, that's during the Board 8 Yacht Club's other side NFT mint, Ethereum's gas fees reached some of the highest prices we have ever seen. At certain points during the mint, a single baseline fee exceeded an eye-watering, testicle crunching six and a half thousand dollars just to do anything. It's crazy. Now, no one likes paying gas fees. They're like the $150 per adult ticket to get into Disney World Florida. The grim and ridiculous necessity biased towards the advantage and the privilege but one we have to bear anyway, at least if we all want to go ride the magic teacups. Oh, <laughs> and hence, one of the most talked about aspects of the merge is that age old question, will it make this whole DeFi, NFT, crypto thing cheaper? No, that's the answer. No, I'm sorry. The network's transition to proof of stake is a change to a consensus mechanism only. That means it won't alter the network's transitional throughput and that means gas fees will stay pretty much the same. You're just paying the stakers instead of the miners. So yes, Ethereum developers are anticipating that their Web3 part tickets will be just as high as they were before. They even say this on their website. Lower gas fees are possible on Ethereum, but right now only through layer two solutions like Polygon and Lootring, which employ various techniques like sidechains and rollups to take transaction data off the Ethereum blockchain where they can package it up and send it back to Ethereum like a zip file. We did a whole other video on that a few weeks ago, so I won't cover it again, but I will leave a link in the description below if you'd like to go check it out. So if it's not gonna make transactions cheaper, maybe it'll make them faster, right? Right? Now, the thing is, this myth is intrinsically linked to the last one. Gas fees are, after all, premiums paid to validators to get your information recorded on the blockchain. The more congested the network, the higher the fee. So if transactions are faster, hey presto, less congestion and thus lower fees. Now Ethereum's beacon chain, the chain that the mainnet will be merged with, will, it will allow blocks to be published every 12 seconds and that's 1.3 seconds faster than the capabilities of the mainnet at the moment. So yes, technically this means that when the merge happens, Ethereum will be a teensy tiny tiny bit faster. The bad news though, this change is gonna be barely perceptible to users. It'll be like adding a three inch sail to the side of a top quality speedboat and expecting it to break a world record. Don't matter how hard that wind's blowing, it just ain't gonna happen. No, for the network to go faster and therefore be cheaper without the need for layer two solutions, we're gonna have to wait for something called sharding to be implemented on the proof of stake Ethereum blockchain. That's the process of splitting up the network into smaller shards, which can process transactions independently of each other. 
Adding this would increase the blockchain's transaction throughput from its current speed of around 13 transactions per second to supposedly somewhere in the region of 100,000. Thing is, sharding is really, really hard to implement. In most cases, it requires every single node in the network to contain an exact copy of the blockchain and be able to synchronize in real time with all of the others. Basically, all you need to know here is going to be a while, even after the merge happens, before sharding can be fully implemented, with the most optimistic of estimates placing the upgrade somewhere in 2023. So that's clear. Ever play the early 2000s classic video game Red Faction, where a bunch of miners on Mars rebel and overthrow the status quo? It was sort of like Total Recall, but you could play it. Well, some people are worried that that's exactly what will happen with the $19 billion Ethereum mining industry. And honestly, this isn't so much wild speculation, it's actually quite a valid concern. Ethereum mining companies like Ethermine and FTPool have spent massive amounts of money on the setups required to carry out the GPU intensive work of solving the mathematical equations required to secure their network. That's basically what proof of work is, big computers that solve difficult encryption puzzles and go brrrr. Understandably then, one must imagine that any risk to all of that financial outlay on the part of the miners and their potential lost profits mustn't have gone down well with them. So why don't these miners just switch their setup over to Bitcoin mining? Well, Ethereum's mining has pretty much always been considered more profitable than when compared to Bitcoin. This is because Ethereum is smart contract compatible, meaning it hosts an ecosystem of decentralized apps and DeFi platforms, and you know it, you've been there. And this results in the blockchain having much higher transactional demand compared to Bitcoin. Essentially, lots of people wanting to do lots of different things all the time the exact antithesis of my Friday nights. But this means there's higher rewards for ETH mining than there are for Bitcoin mining. So now, these Ethereum miners have the hard choice of making their business significantly less profitable by switching to Bitcoin mining, or biting the bullet, selling their inventory, calling it a good run, buying some sheep and starting a cattle ranch out in Wyoming. Although, if they were buying sheep, would it be a cattle ranch? I'd, I'd know which one I'd pick anyway. Indeed, one prominent ETH miner, Chandler Guo, went so far as to launch a campaign protesting the upgrade, and is now wanting to hard fork the post-merge Ethereum to preserve a proof-of-work chain with the token ETHW. Though I guess you could call it Ethereum Classic 2 if you want. However, while this might make some sense on paper, in order for ETHW token to have any value, the chain would actually have to have things happening on it, you know, transactions, token launches, DeFi stuff, literally anything really. And what good natured DeFi protocol, for example, is going to take the highly, highly unusual move of shunning all of their peers to launch on a non-mainstream Ethereum fork, all for the sake of some miners they probably don't even know. Nah, it's not going to happen. And as a result, any new chain won't have the same utility as the mainnet, and therefore won't have anywhere near the value. And so the rebellion would soon falter and fail, its foot soldiers slain and leaders tossed into the blood-soaked mud of bad market ideas. Proof of stake is certainly a more efficient and less energy intensive way of running a blockchain. The Ethereum Foundation estimates the move will reduce energy consumption across the Ethereum network by approximately 99.5%. But some proof-of-work purists have been pointing out that the new consensus mechanism is not without its flaws. Because proof-of-stake validation power is dished out based on the number of tokens held, there's the possibility of centralization. It would take some pretty immense buying power and some equally massive cojones, but theoretically, if someone could acquire 51% of all ETH tokens in supply, they could effectively control the Ethereum network. That's called a 51% attack, and it's much more difficult to pull off on a proof-of-work chain because there, validation involves computers solving increasingly difficult mathematical problems. That doesn't make proof-of-work blockchains particularly efficient. Bitcoin's energy expenditure is now reckoned to be the equivalent of the power consumption of all of Thailand, for example, but it does make them extremely secure. So yes, while the merge will theoretically open up Ethereum to increase centralization and as a result is less secure, the reality is that the amounts of value we're talking about here are still way too much for any conceivable 51% attack on the network. 
Even at its currently depressed valuation, you need over $100 billion worth of ETH to get there. And that's double the capital Elon Musk was sort of prepared to commit to acquire Twitter. And all just a mess with a network for lols? I mean, it's possible someone like Apple or the US government could do it, but by all means, not probable. Just like my chances of being allowed to play Elden Ring this weekend. The popularity of Lido DAO's staked ETH, or STETH, plus alternative ETH staking solutions on Coinbase probably brought about our last myth. Once the merge happens, we'll all be able to unstake our ETH, right? With more than $20 billion of value already staked in prep for the upgrade, there's a whole donkey butt load of ETH stakers out there eager to unlock their funds and reap their rewards. Fortunately for them, they're going to have to wait. You see, the Ethereum dev community has already confirmed that the merge will not fac immediately facilitate the unlocking of already staked funds. Investors will have to hold on till the first major post-merge update, known as the Shanghai upgrade, for that to happen. This upgrade isn't expected for at least six months after the merge, and that could stretch out even further given Ethereum developers infamously stretch Armstrong timescales. On the plus side though, when Shanghai does arrive, it'll also bring with it EVM object format, or EOF, which is apparently a new type of smart contract with super advanced functionality. We'll let you know how super advanced once we've figured out exactly what it does. Gosh. We're finished already. We hope this video has brought some clarity to a few of the top myths that have been mystifying Ethereum users in the run up to M Day. But what do you think? Will the upgrade revolutionize crypto as we know it? Or is all this getting a bit out of hand? We want to know your thoughts in the comments below and do give us a follow if you're liking these crypto snaps. As ever, all your feedback, support, and criticism helps us make better shows in the future. Until next time, though, whatever your stake, always remember to look first, then leap.